So we'll just kind of see. All right. All right. So I have a few review slides, few review figures. Um, so this actually is what I kind of put on the board over here. Um, and remember that um, Farrell, Farrell, Hadley, thank you, sorry. Mr. Hadley back in the 1700s came up with a single cell model, which is really two cells, if you ask me. Um, but now we really know it to be kind of a three cell model, and things kind of fall into place, like those easterly trade winds that Columbus took over from Sail the Ocean Blue with, okay? So we definitely have kind of this three dimensional sort of thing going on, and we're going to continue to talk about this. Um, so don't forget everything that we talked about last time we were together on Monday. And actually, this is the last review figure that I want to do. And we talked about that hot spot, which, you know, before, actually, earlier in the class, I said, you know, the hot spot's the equator, right? Well, we actually talked about how the hot spot um, in June, it goes up to, um, yeah, June 21st, it's 23 and a half degrees north latitude, right? And the hot spot in December 21st is 23 and a half degrees south. So really, that hot spot needs to wander, and we actually see it wandering throughout the year. The reason it's not straight is because we got the whole difference between ocean and land. Okay, otherwise, it would be straight. So um, this wandering intertropical convergence zone, wandering hot spot, is important to talk about. Um, the next topic is kind of short. It is monsoons. So before we go on to the topic of monsoons <coughs> on the next few slides, I want to emphasize a couple of places on this here. <laughs> so you're probably most familiar um, uh, when people talk about monsoons of the, the, the Indian monsoons. And so I'm just going to kind of circle this. Let me pick a different color. How about, hmm, how about green? Okay, here. Okay. Oh, didn't show up. It won't admit it. Hello. There it goes. Oh, it did show up. Okay. Thank you. Okay. So here, this is the summertime. Okay. Now let's look at the same region. It's in the northern hemisphere, so it has summer in, in June and winter in, in December, just like us. So six months later, let's circle the same spot. And check out where the intertropical conversion zone has gone. You're like, dude. So basically, instead of being in the um, clearly in the, the North Hadley cell in January. Okay, it's kind of like straddling the Hadley cells. The other thing, and I was kind of scratching my head on this in my office, I'm like, now how does that work? So this should be the Hadley cell, right? Right next to the intertropical convergence zone, right? So here's the deal, and I'll kind of show you where my quandary was. Let's see, what color should I pick? I'm not going to pick purple. Is that what I want to say down here? Yeah. Nope, let's go down. This right here, check out which direction those winds are flowing. Like, oh my gosh. Those look like um, easterly trades. They look like they're a, what we call a westerly wind. So here's the deal. Here's what's guiding those. Do you see the low up here? That's an L right there. I just obscured it. Okay, what direction did we say in the northern hemisphere uh, coils force twists movement around a low? Counterclockwise. Wait, yeah. counterclockwise. Wait, counterclockwise. Yeah, counter for low, right? Yeah, counterclockwise, yeah. Yeah, that is yeah. what I want. So actually, to me, and this is what we call a, uh, this L right here that has star next to it that you can't see underneath it. That's actually what we call a semi-permanent low. And so that actually is clockwise motion around there. And that's what's creating those westerlies, because otherwise they'd be trade easterlies. Mm -hmm. So we're going to talk about this monsoon deal right here. But before I do, can you already see kind of here in July, kind of what we call this, this is what we call the prevailing wind, okay? We have the Himalayan, and it's hard to see, but we have the Himalayan mountains right here. Okay, prevailing wind brings this warm, moist air, hits the Himalayan uh, mountains, and we called it orographic lifting, yeah. And it just dumps on them. 
Okay, if you look in the dry season, actually this is going to be wet. I'll put the word wet down here. Okay, check out the dry season for them. Now their prevailing wind is not coming from the Indian Ocean. Okay, now their prevailing wind up here okay, is basically coming off the land, on the land. Very dry. That's it. That's your monsoon seasons. That's your dry monsoon season in the winter, and that's your wet monsoon season in the summer. That's it. So when the ITCZ moves up in July, mm -hmm. July, that low comes in and it pretty much stays there for the duration yes. of that season? Yep, and it creates this prevailing wind. Yep. I know. The other one's a little more subtle. And actually, I don't know if you guys, you guys may have heard this before, but we have a monsoon season here in North America. Um, or a monsoon occur, and I think we have a couple of them, but I've circled this low right down here, okay, and again, it's associated with kind of the prevailing feature of the intertropical convergence zone moving up. And the thing about this low is, you guys told me counterclockwise, so the thing about that is we kind of have like this going on, and what's, what's happening is we can get dumped on by this warm, moist air from either the, um, the Pacific or even the Gulf. Okay. And, of course, we have potential for lifting there with mountain ranges and stuff. So, actually, this is wet, a wet monsoon season for us. And this one up here is dry. So, there you go, monsoons so many words. So this doesn't have to do with monsoon jet. It's the next slide. But what this has to do with is kind of the ITCZ, the Intertropical Convergent Zone, where your easterly trades converge. And we actually have, like said, it's kind of a hot spot. So basically you have the lifting because the warm air hits the tropo, uh, tropopause and kind of flattens out. That lifting mechanism kind of provides a chronic band of clouds. So that's what this is kind of showing. Masses are going to keep rising. And mm -hmm. Yeah, Seattle. it just kind of keeps rising, hits the lifting condensation level, yep. And voila, you have. All right, so by definition, um, it's going to be a pair of uh, two seasons. Monsoons need to have a dry and a wet season. Okay, so a pair of deals. And they, what they have in common is basically the intertropical convergence zone is moving. Um, so the winter season, um, what we're going to look at in actually, I guess both cases in the Indian monsoon and in North American monsoon, uh, in the winter season, basically you have a dry um, wind uh, that's coming from the land out to the sea. And notice, I, I don't know if in your notes it's wrong. Let me know. Okay. Yeah, this was wrong in my slides. So where it says summer season, what it really should say is um, in the summer season, just like we saw with India, basically off the Indian Ocean, it has that um, uh, prevailing wind from the sea to the land. Not the other way around. I think I've used these slides for maybe three or four years. First time I got it. Oh, wow. Well. Okay, so again, what causes both the Indian monsoon season and the North American monsoon season is the movement of the hotspot, movement of the intertropical convergence zone, which moves everything. Okay, so the Asian one they're talking about is the one I've been referring to as in India. And the other one is kind of our, our southwest we'll look at in North America. So this is actually, the reason I started out with this pair of, or the slides I did was I wanted to show you, this, this is actually an excerpt of the figure we looked at earlier. This is zoomed in in the summertime in um, this part of the world. Okay. And again, if you're like, I had to chase that down. I'm like, how did that become a westerly? And it has to do with that semi-permanent high there. So it's really in the Hadley cell need to be um, um, easterly trades. So there's your wet season. Okay, here's your dry season. And if you compare those Two, you can see that that purple line or blue line, whatever you want to call, you want to call it, has moved down here in the winter time from this northern hemisphere location. Because if you're like me, you might have noticed like uh, 
kind of the drama of it with regard to weather that they get there, the monsoon seasons. Oh, that's just kind of the way it is. So we'll take a look at that one in our southwest. And I kind of showed you that, that L, that, that low that was over, I don't know, was over California or uh, New Mexico or Arizona, that low. Actually, movement around that low is going to be clockwise, or excuse me, counterclockwise. <laughs> counterclockwise in the northern hemisphere, not an L, a low. Okay. So during our summer months, we actually, in that area, they have uh, more precipitation than usual. All right. And this is to prove how they have more precipitation than usual. So uh, you recognize maybe the climatograms, the yellow? Yeah. So this is throughout the year down here. Okay, this is the January through December sort of thing. And these blue lines here are showing you precipitation. So actually it has a dry season, and then what I circled there is the rainy season. Yeah. Yeah, the temperature does spike up in July and August. Heaven. There's the word Jason in there. What's that? Jason. They do. <laughs> Jason D. <laughs> Who's that? Sorry, I pointed out. It's okay. Oh, very good. All right, switching gears. We do a lot of that in here, I feel like. So part of the reason I put this on the board was to kind of remind you the the three cells, right? One, two, three cells in each hemisphere. So of course we have, this is, yeah, <laughs> three cells down there. But as I've drawn these, um, these are the westerlies. Oh, sorry. No, these are the easterlies, thanks. These are the trade winds. These are the easterly trades. Oh, let's see, trades. And this one in the feral cell, that's us. These are the mid-latitude westerlies. And these are the polar easterlies. So as I've drawn them, and I've, this is not 3D at all, right? I'm, I'm going to put the word surface over here. Surface winds. Okay, because now, like I said, I'm switching gears. I want to talk of, remember I said one of my favorite words is a loft, A-L-O-F-T. I want to talk about these winds up here. Okay, so here's the deal. At upper elevations, okay, um, like the slide says, at upper elevations, basically over our hot spot. Now, this is a little bit confusing. Let's try to think how I'm going to show this. I'm going to show the hot spot. Let's see. Hot spots down here. Yeah, this should work. All right. I'll pick on green. Where there's warm air down here near the equator. Okay, I always told you when it was hot, think of low pressure, right? Here's the deal. At upper elevations, because it's warm air, it kind of distributes itself kind of all the way up. Okay, so this is a loft right here. That is a loft. Meet a loft. Let's switch gears and go over here. At first I thought you were saying pull off. <laughs> the thing about cold air is I've always kind of told you cold air, think dense and think high pressure. But here's what happens at a loft at upper elevations. I'm going to go way up here. I'm, gonna sh I'm just going to show you that high pressure. Then I'm going to show it petering out. So actually, and I don't know if I did it justice. Let me put a few more dots right here. At upper elevations... A loft up here at upper elevations basically what you end up with uh, believe it or not is a low pressure and you have a high pressure over here upper elevations Isn't that to do something in chapter six that we're talking about? yeah they switch the uh, it could be diverging. no I don't think so but I did mention it in the previous chapter familiar just that there's a low here and then a high up and then a high yeah high but the thing the thing i want to emphasize is air moves from a high to a low and so here we go basic or i shouldn't say air moves from high to low i should say a pressure gradient force is created from a high to a low 
So there's your pressure gradient force. And we expect air to go along with that, but we know the Earth is spinning, so we have this, what's called the, you know, the core, we have deflection to the right, and so basically our, this is our deflection to the right. This is the, what we call the resulting wind because it is deflected, deflected to right. That's very look, ugly looking right. Deflected to the right. It should go where the red line is, but because the Earth is spinning, it's deflected to the right. And we actually did talk about gradient winds and geostrophic winds. It's actually going to kind of find itself between the ion, what we call the isobars. So actually, it's going to find itself in the groove. This is in the groove. I think I used that term before. So basically, instead of keeping going to the right, it's eventually just going to line itself up with those with those, the isobars. And it's going to be just what we call, since it's coming from the west, it's a westerly wind. So my point here is if I could make this three dimensions, okay, over here on this map, the way I think of it, is basically aloft at upper elevations, you have a wind from the west at all, you know, under the Hadley, under the Farrell, and under the Polar. That's what you do. Okay, upper elevations. Left in the southern hemisphere and right. Right. Mm -hmm. Yep. That's the deflection to the right. And that's what we call geostrophic wind. And I think we ran into that before. It's where it's in the groove. That geostrophic wind I call it in the groove. Okay. So that difference, that, that pressure gradient from a high pressure near the equator, I know it's warm, but it's kind of spinning, yeah, to a low pressure uh, at the poles, that actually, the pressure gradient increases with elevation in general. So the winds do get stronger and stronger. I think we talked about the winds getting stronger and stronger too because of friction, didn't we? Okay. And then here's the deal, and I've chased this down a few times because I want to get it settled in my own mind, that once you go on to the next layer, like the stratosphere, once you go past the, um, the tropopause into the stratosphere, the winds start to get less and less. Could be, because the pressure gradient force has kind of petered out. Yeah, I don't know. <laughs> All right. So aloft, A-L-O-F-T. We're still looking aloft. And um, actually, we have these cool things called jet streams. I bet you heard of them before. There are a pair of jet streams in each hemisphere, which makes four, right? <laughs> so the northern hemisphere has a polar jet stream and a subtropical jet stream. And they're like a little tube of fast-moving air. And um, it's, I've, I haven't followed it much, but I know that if you're flying a hot air balloon, you want to know where these fast-moving ribbons of air are to kind of use them to your advantage. And I know that sometimes, um, you know, we don't have control over the, the jet streams, obviously, but sometimes the jet stream can actually segment or kind of do some funky things, and then your weather balloon is guys are cursing at and everything. Okay? So with jet streams. And let's see what Dirk says about jet streams. Let's ask Dirk. So, like, the video we watched, he talked about kind of the... Do we, we've talked about Rossby waves in here, right? That Did that look kind of like Rossby waves? Yep. And then he talked about um, we have ridges and troughs. Yeah, not ruffles, but ridges and troughs. Yeah. So. All right, so this actually is kind of what I, a little bit what I drew on the board. You kind of see uh, the three cells, okay, in the northern hemisphere. Okay, so this is your, um, kind of get your wits about you. This is your ITCZ. This is your hot spot. Okay, oops, sorry. Um, we have the Hadley cell, the Farrell cell, and the Polar cell. And then the jets are located here. We have the subtropical jet that is actually between the Hadley and the Farrell, and then we have the polar jet stream that is between the Farrell and the polar. So, fast ribbon, ribbons of, of ribbons of fast moving air. Um, I'll go ahead and say the subtropical jet, and I think I have it on here. But in the summertime, summertime, the subtropical jet will bring us uh, thunderstorms, tea storms. 
it won't bring us thunderstorms, but it can provide warm, moist air that gives us these. Um, uh, when we talk about these, let's see, have you ever like been sleeping at night and you had thunderstorm after thunderstorm after thunderstorm? That was the subtropical jet, and it's called a what's it called? Uh, mesoscale convective complex, basically a bunch of thunderstorms. Okay. Um, the polar jet stream, though, is actually a player in kind of giving us our our troughs and our ridges and kind of our alternating highs or lows or stalling stalling that weather. So we talked, um, this shouldn't be too surprising, we said that in the summertime, the intertropical convergent zone moves north. In the wintertime, the intertropical convergent zone moves south. So here you see the polar jet stream wanders with the intertropical convergent zone. Um, it's a lot faster in the wintertime than in the summertime. That polar jet stream. Yeah, it's significant. Okay, so um, there are your two jet streams, kind of the blue ones, the polar jet stream, and the pink one is the subtropical jet stream in the northern hemisphere. To kind of remind you where they are, this is kind of a review slide. I guess we didn't talk about Rossby waves yet. You mentioned them in the did last I? chapter and said we'd get into them. Oh, good. Yeah, I did mention them. But now here finally is the, and, um, the word in your notes. And I've heard it pronounced like with a soft S and a hard S. So Rossby or Rosby. I don't know. Rossby waves. Um, but basically, now on the next slide, I kind of tell you those, the jet stream can kind of be straight or the jet stream can kind of be wiggly. Okay, and we think of the jet stream as kind of all other winds at upper elevations kind of contour to the, whatever the jet stream is doing. Okay, so um, Rossby waves um, are going to be these kind of little kinks, these little big kinks, I guess. Um, and there can be three to six Rossby waves at a given time that encircle the Earth. And I'll show you some pictures. Okay. Um, and I think that, that link would take us back to Dirk. So this is definitely a case um, where the pink is the jet stream. Can you see where it's definitely not going straight? It kind of goes off, uh, from what I can tell, it goes off the map, up and down. Okay, that is definitely a wiggly jet stream. Okay, and kind of how how it does that? That's the that's the Rossby wave I'm talking about. What's that? I would say it tells you how fast with the different colors of pink. Yeah, the bottom, how fast it's Oh, yeah, down here. Thank mm -hmm. you. The darker the pink, the the faster the moving air. So this is really common. Like, um, if you want to see a map of what the jet streams are doing, they'll color code them like this. So just like Dirk said, um, he even used the word um, stalls. Remember, kind of at the end where he said we could have the we could have the the low kind of stall, and we have wet weather, or we could have the high stall, and we have dry conditions. Okay. So the deal is, is if the jet stream, or yeah, if the jet stream is nice and wiggly and kind of moving like it's supposed to, remember at upper elevations we definitely have this whole from west to east sort of thing going, then you get alternating, uh, you know, dry, wet, dry, wet. If it's not, or if, I think it must be on the next slide, I'm going to talk about certain, about kind of pinches off. Maybe I don't. There we go. If a little chunk gets pinched off, and the jet stream gets to going straight with no kinks, then basically you're going to have stalled weather, what we call stalled weather pattern. So the straight is called zonal, and I usually think it's like football. Like if you're going to throw a football to the end zone, you're going to throw it straight. So I think a zonal throw is straight. Yeah. And meridional flow is kind of meandering. That's the kind of up and down. So this, that's why the slide says meand, uh, meridional flow has kind of a, a north south sort of component to it. It creates your ridges and troughs. Okay. So if it's straight, which means no Rossby waves basically, then uh, you could have a stalled pattern there. Or basically, um, so it could be kind of exaggerated, or if nothing stalled over you, you could have kind of like, eh, kind of tame conditions. Um, with the wavy flow, meridional flow, kind of think of alternating conditions. So, 
So meridonial flow, and I'll go ahead and kind of put it up here. We talked about lows were troughs and highs were ridges. So I'll go ahead and kind of draw it down here. So meridonial flow, this is my jet stream, kind of goes up and down and up and down. And just kind of like what Dirk just said, kind of think of what you're going to see, um, see here in the trough. He did, yeah, I think you might have said this. It's going to be your low pressure, and here what you're going to see in your ridge is going to be your high pressure. Okay, and then we have another high here. And just to kind of bring things full circle, or in this unit of material we talked about highs are anticyclones, and air moves clockwise. <laughs> Okay, and uh, lows are cyclones, and air moves counterclockwise. And while we're at it, lows bring generally, um, let's switch to orange, lows bring generally uh, wet conditions, generally, and highs generally bring dry. We would call this a meridonial flow. If you got straight, you just kind of got basically in the northern hemisphere, you got cold air up here and warm air down here. Okay, so you don't have those cyclones and anticyclones. So um, on the next slide, I'm going to kind of show you where you can get too wavy. Basically, your waves in the slide we looked at with that pink jet stream, it almost looked like it could pinch off what I'm going to describe here in a minute. So basically, if you do have that situation, you can have a bit of cold air basically isolated from its buddies up there and you can have a cold uh, cold weather outbreak down here. So the way you look at this is kind of from left to right and then top to bottom. So um, this is slide number one or two, three, and four and you can kind of see over time what's going on. So notice the top one to me, situation one, kind of looks like a zonal flow. I don't see any really raspy waves up there, situation one. Situation two, I can definitely see some kind of meridonial flow there, okay, with the troughs and ridges. And situation three actually is kind of see, showing you kind of where we're getting almost kind of a pinching off sort of situation with this blob. And what that blob was is it originated, and we're going to talk about air masses in the next, um, next chapter, but that blob originated up in the polar region, so that's a really cold blob. That's the blue color, right? And so actually then situation four looks like it's back to zonal. Okay, and with zonal, you don't get things moving, basically. What you have is what you're going to keep. And if it's mild normal, then you're going to keep mild normal. If it's cold, you're going to keep cold. If it's wet, you're going to so keep wet. it actually pinched off that cold, cold. Mm -hmm. and it, then because it stays zonal, that cold's going to sit there. Yes, exactly. It pinched that whole thing off, and now instead of having normal seasonal conditions here, Basically, we're stuck with that cold piece of that cold air mass, or an air, cold air mass stuck there. It just sits there, and like you said, Autumn, it's not going to move because we're kind of on the zonal flow now, not down there. So that's called stalling, it's stalling right there. Yeah, I think I inserted a picture here too. If I brought a picture. So we've, been about, we've been talking about prevailing winds, right? Prevailing winds, the uh, tr easterly trades, the mid latitude westerlies, and the polar easterlies. Well, the thing is that those surface winds actually, when it comes time to making our oceans move, okay, it's the surface winds that make the oceans move. Okay. Um, so the prevailing winds kind of make that happen. So here's another thing we talked about on Monday, I think. Let's see if I can find a different color. So we said at the surface, we kind of, the intertropical convergence zone, we generally have kind of a low pressure there because of that air is ascending. So we have semi-permanent lows. 
I'll just put lows in blue there. Okay, we said that actually at this intersection between the Hadley and the Farrell, we said the air is, is, is squishing down there, and actually we call that, the since it's squishing down, it's getting warmer, and actually we can find deserts here about 30 between the Hadley and the Farrell, and so actually that creates a high pressure. And up here, we actually have ascending air again. So up here between the ferrule and the polar, we have another low. So kind of there. And I could put the word semi-permanent next to those blue words. So these semi-permanent low, semi-permanent high, semi-permanent low. So when it says semi-permanent subtropical high, that's this one right here. Semi, uh, what's it called? Subtropical? Yes. And when it says, um, that's all it is. Yeah. But there are other lows. So this one actually, you don't, this is a repeat slide. You guys don't have this in, your, in order. But before we talk about the water, I wanted to remind you about the wind. Okay? So these aren't ocean currents, water currents, but this actually is wind. And so one of the things I like to say is you've heard of the Bermuda Triangle, right? I don't know. So interesting. I don't know what I think about the Bermuda Triangle, but if you, it is funny, but if you've heard it, that sort of thing, the Bermuda Triangle is in this area right here. Okay. So this is a semi-permanent subtropical high right there. This would mean that that actually is the band kind of between the, the Hadley and the Farrell cell. Okay. Um, and notice that actually, so that's the summertime. In the wintertime, don't got it there. Yeah, we have something else kind of a little bit down the way. Okay, so there's that. Now, these arrows are surface winds, so let's take a look at them. Um, let's pick on the Bermuda Triangle, and it gets a little, let's say, dicey or whatever. Okay, so high is right there. There's your high, and go counterclockwise. No, clock, no, counterclockwise around a high, or just clockwise around a high. Counterclockwise around a low. Thank you. Also, I keep writing it down. I know. I, because I keep forgetting. That's why you have a note card. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Around a high, it's it's anti-cyclone, so it's opposite what how the Earth is spinning, and the Earth is spinning counterclockwise, so right. it's clockwise around a high. Final answer. Okay. <laughs> so how are we doing here? Do you see clockwise around a high? Yes. I do too. Phew. Very good. Um, let's pick on the southern hemisphere. Around a high, it would be counterclockwise. Very good. Do you see counterclockwise? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so that's that's what that is. Now, I mentioned that because now switching gears, and I don't have the month thing. I don't have like the six months apart. But these are not wind currents. These are ocean currents. And actually, I think we've talked about this before. I mean, this is the last topic we need to talk oh. about. Um, well, this and El Nino and La Nina. So let's go ahead and, um, again, this is just for a snapshot, you know, just in general. I'm going to put an H here, okay? Um, Muta high and all that sort of thing, kind of between the subtropical high, uh, between the Hadley and the feral cell. Um, and do you see the clockwise motion? Mm -hmm. Good. Me too. Okay, around a high. And so that's what the Atlantic, right? Mm -hmm. Let's put an H smack dab here in the Pacific. Okay. Clockwise. Let's put another, well, actually, this, this H is continued from that one. It's kind of a wraparound, right? That's specific. All right. That's pretty good. Um, let's look in the southern hemisphere right quick. Yeah, so we'll put highs here in these ocean basins. And look for counterclockwise. 
Does it work? I think so too. The other thing, we talked about this before, the difference between the red and the blue, what does that mean? The red's warm, the blue is cold, exactly. So, and we, uh, you know, have kind of talked about this where if you're trying to decide on a vacation spot, you know, the East Coast, the West Coast sort of thing, um, keep in mind what the temperature of your ocean is going to be like. I talked to somebody this weekend who um, was from the Washington uh, State area. He says it's beautiful out there. And he said that um, the water, you know, he grew up out there and he was probably my age. And the water out there, what it used to be is even in the summertime or in August, September, whatever, the lag came, you had to wear a wetsuit. Mm -hmm. You could not. But nowadays, he said, if you're willing to kind of come out with, you know, shivering, Red skin. <laughs> you, you don't need to wear a wetsuit. He, his point was that the ocean temperatures are, are warm out there. But there, what I started to say is there, here, you know, if you're going to the West Coast, that's why that California current, Okay. Well, compared to on the East Coast, the, I'm talking about current wise. Yeah, the, East current, the, the, the East Coast, the East, the East current, the East Coast, the East Coast. If you're not wanting to like totally freeze your butt off, that's where I would go swimming. Right. Yeah. Well, Unless so you don't California. want to. That's, that's what. That's what I mean. Yeah. Wise. Yeah. Not so. While I have it on the slide, oh, by the way, so it says five, five major ocean gyres, and actually we marked them. Can you see? We have two up here. Okay, this one's a continuation over there, and we have three down there. Those are the major ocean gyres with the H's there. Um, all right, and they are, they are assembled by little, uh, little currents. Now, uh, the last topic I want to talk about is El Nino, La Nina. In order to understand that, we are going to focus on, let's see, which color should I pick? I'll pick purple. We're going to focus on this part of the world. So South America, you're going to see actually to understand El Nino, La Nina, you're going to see something called the Peruvian current, okay? Comes up um, off of the west coast of South America. Does that work for you? Okay. All right. So think South America. I just showed you Peruvian current, right? Okay, kind of swinging up uh, around that semi-permanent high, going counterclockwise because it's in the southern hemisphere, or going clockwise because it's in the southern hemisphere. Counter going counterclockwise because it's in the southern hemisphere. <laughs> Dang it. But I would put it on my note card. <laughs> yeah. every, and, like every page of note, high they clockwise. Use my note card, right? Uh, I think five by eight this semester. It's not required, but you can bring one. It's pretty big. Well, the reason I ask is because I have, I have a three by five. Yeah, you can, uh, as long as they add up to be five by eight, you could, you know, whatever five times eight, that's 40 inches squared, you can do your scale it up. All right. <coughs> Let me know if you have any questions about the math. Ask Mr. Day. <laughs> um, so... In order to understand <coughs> El Nino, La Nina, um, we need to talk about this phenomenon called upwelling. And the word is kind of what it is. And it occurs along the coast. So basically, if I make my hand South America, upwelling is going to, and you know, this is, this is the ocean, this is the air. Okay, upwelling is this, where basically you have water coming up from the bottom of the ocean, up, upwelling along the coast. Could be along the west coast. Oh, thank you. I'll have to fix that one, too. <laughs> well, I was in a hurry. Yeah, see, this should be west. Thanks. Well, don't like Patrick, you know, it's much more called east. Okay, so, so upwelling occurs in California. It also occur, occurs um, in South America. That would be the country of Peru, hopefully, right? Over there, along some other countries. So the thing about upwelling, and like the slide says, it's, it's important for a number of reasons. One is that upwelling um, kind of cools off the continent on the west coast of the continent. And upwelling, though, is also important to the, um, the marine life, that's the ecosystem that's kind of established there. Because that it's not only is it cold, but it's nutrient rich. So upwelling is a good thing. Fishermen count on it and all that sort of thing. So 
Um, I'm going to show you a uh, few figures, and actually, uh, before we get into El Nino, La Nina, this is, this is what normally looks like in that part of the, of, the, of the world. So we have North America, of course this is showing South America, this is the Peruvian current, kind of, this would be the ocean gyre for the, what, the South Pacific, right? Okay, um, going South Atlantic. Pacific, South Atlantic. South, oh, no, no, South Pacific, Pacific right. yeah. Now this this right here, can you see our can you see our converging easterlies? Okay. So we have Hadley Cell, Hadley Cell, okay. We're counting on our easterly here. So the other thing is over here, and sometimes they call this Indonesia, the Indonesian islands are Australia. Okay. Over there is kind of the other side. This is I've heard it referred to as the Walker cell when I've chased it down before. Walker. Walker, yeah, like Walker, I'm not even going to say his name. So, okay. So it's kind of a three-dimensional sort of thing. So in general, under normal conditions, we expect kind of, um, kind of dry conditions over here and kind of wet conditions over there. And that's kind of why. Basically, we have this easterly, um, Easter, our easterly trade winds create the, help create this current. Um, actually, then... Um, that ascends here, and so it expands and cools, and it condenses, and we have wet conditions over there, over in the Indonesia area. Mm. All right, this now, notice what's different about this slide. And I think this, I'm not sure if this one is the figure from the textbook or not. I need to talk about El Nino, and if you're familiar with Spanish, that's like the masculine version, right? Okay. Opposite of El Nino would be La Nina, right? In El Nino, look what's different here. Try to find your easterly trade winds. Okay, and what you're going to see actually in this scenario, now in the next scenario I'm going to show you that, that you can have easterly trades, but they just aren't as strong. But in this case, you have a westerly wind. You're like, dude. Okay. Then if you don't have that easterly trade, then you don't have your upwelling. So basically I'm going to put no upwelling over there. And no upwelling, that's not bad for, that's bad for the ecosystem. No upwelling has issues for the organ power, for the fish industry. The other thing is basically since you've kind of reversed everything, instead of being dry, check this out. Now this is wet, and it's not used to being wet. Again, this is El Nino conditions, and this is dry. It's not used to being so dry over there. Um, let me go ahead and label it. Sometimes these islands, I've seen them referred to as the Indonesian islands. Indonesia, okay. So over there, it's drier than it should be. What's that? That was Indonesia. They, I mean, collectively, I think the Indonesian islands would kind of cover all that. So I don't know. I don't know. Look on a map, and if you can kind of identify it near Australia, that would probably do it for you. So over there, actually, they see sea levels drop. Yeah. And over here, that's wetter than usual. That's El Dino. Okay, so it has consequences. And this slide kind of summarizes some consequences or conditions associated with El Nino. Yes, James. There's the door. Sorry, <laughs> That works for me. Really, I should have said, if, if, you, if ever I go too late, you can always leave. That's the beauty of being in college. You can get up whenever you want to. I, I, be, I don't want, yeah. I don't, okay. I, I don't blame you. Can you please so, go back? I can. So it kind of goes back and forth between El Nino and La Nina. La Nina conditions um, actually go shorter than El Nino, okay? And you're going to see me say that the La Nina conditions have a good weekend. Actually, I have fun. Good. The La Nina conditions are different in that they don't necessarily reverse. They actually have a stronger, um, a stronger, uh, easterly traits, okay? So La Niñas look like this. Here's all that you need to know about La Niñas, and I don't have a figure that goes along with this. 
But at the surface, aside from the whole walker cell thing, at the surface, like the slide says, I would emphasize if this is my SA stands for South America, and I'll, I'll put the island of Australia over here, okay, what you would see, um, I think there's a figure from your textbook, is we're used to these easterly trade, these converging easterly trades, they will intensify. So what does intensification mean? It means it's even wetter than usual over here, and it's even drier than usual over here. Okay, so that's kind of how I think of that. So then the last few slides, one of the ways you can differentiate between the two of them, there are, did you get that? Um, we, yeah, we talked about upwelling. Can you see all the red on this one? And so up here, I'm going to say no upwelling. This is no upwelling. Okay, it's hot. It's El Nino. Okay, here, there's extra upwelling. Extra upwelling. What does that mean? It's cold. Yep. So this actually is a figure from your textbook, and it's not up to date. Uh, but it kind of looks historically back there to 1965 between um, the El Nino years and the La Nina years. Okay, and it's generally called the Southern Oscillation. The oscillate, if something oscillates, it kind of goes back and forth. Okay, so the oscillation here is back and forth between El Nino and La Nina. Very good. So chapter seven homework will be due uh, on Friday. And thank you for your patience.